Welcome. Uh, this is always the, uh, the, uh, uh, the wake-up session. It's usually the uh, least attended. Um, today, today we're uh, going to be starting with uh, talking about an issue that is of uh, great national importance, although a year and a half ago I wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have thought that. Um, I think for many of us, uh, unlike our panelists, um, we didn't think that much about public employee unions until about a year ago um, when Wisconsin exploded. I'm going to uh, uh, introduce in reverse order here. Um, uh, first, our, our, our third speaker is going to be Sam Estreicher. He's the uh, Dwight Opperman Professor at NYU. He's the center of their labor and employment law, um, uh, 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 director of their center. Um, and he's uh, went to, got his JD from uh, Columbia, his uh, MS in industrial relations from Cornell, and an AB from, uh, from Columbia. Uh, in the middle here uh, is John McGinnis. Um, he's the George Dix professor at Northwestern, my uh, home institution. Um, he has three degrees as well, as all these people do here. Um, he's a BA from Harvard, a JD from Harvard, and he has a master's um, from Oxford. And of relevance to this group particularly, he's a past winner of the Paul Bator Award uh, given by the Federal Society to the uh, best uh, academic under uh, 40. Uh, and our uh, first speaker is Joseph Slater. He's Eugene Balk, a professor of law and values um, uh, at, at Toledo. Now, I, I, I think for a Federalist Society, you think about values, voters, you know, there's sort of the conservative wing in the federal side and the libertarian wing. You think about values voter as, you know, somebody who's sort of in the conservative wing of the, of the party. But, but I think that values might mean something different here. Uh, but I expect we're going to find out very soon. Um, he's, uh, um, uh, he, he also has three degrees. Uh, he has a PhD from uh, Georgetown, um, a JD from Michigan, and a BA from uh, Oberlin. And again, as, um, uh, as with Sam, one of the uh, most prolific uh, uh, writers in the uh, general field of labor law and, uh, and an expert in public appointee unions. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I will, of course, be taking the conservative position this morning. <laughs> the conservative position being that rights that are widely regarded as fundamental human rights across the industrialized democratic world, rights that have existed in the United States and elsewhere for over half a century should not be easily discarded just because of partisan political concerns. Um, that's the conservative position. I understand that Professor McGinnis will be taking the radical position that they should be. Um, as you see, I feel that my position today is to wake everybody up. That's what I said I was going to do, but uh, I mean what I say. Um, also more seriously, um, in lines with what Professor Lindgren said, um, it has been a very interesting year for those of us who, the, the three or four of us in legal academia who specialize in public sector labor law, something I've been trying to convince my colleagues for the past decade uh, is extremely important. As of 2009, over half the people in labor unions in the U.S. were members of public sector unions. That's in part because of a uh, union density of approximately 40 percent. Also public sector labor law, because it is state law and state laws vary considerably, creates lots of fascinating issues from doctrinal interests that would only be fascinating to labor law nerds to uh, really broad public policy uh, types of cases, but I, but I am reminded, and this will, will date me a little bit uh, in terms of the recent interest in public sector labor law, I'm reminded of a event I went to when I was in college uh, back, this will of course date me a bit, it was just after the Iranian Revolution and there was a teach-in about the Iranian Revolution and some elderly professor staggered up to the microphone and said, uh, I've been studying the Shia religion for decades now and no one has ever been interested in it and now they're interested in it but I must say that the reasons that people are interested in it do not please me. So I'm in the same position as that elderly <laughs> professor. Uh, I am glad that people are now interested in public sector labor law uh, but I am not particularly in favor of the reasons that that has happened. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, waves of laws that were passed in 2011, especially the laws in Wisconsin and my home state of Ohio. Um, and my 
argument is going to be, again, that these laws were passed for entirely partisan purposes, that they were part, they, the entire justification for these laws is to attempt to cripple an institutional supporter of the Democratic Party, and that the other reasons that were proffered in support of these laws do not stand up to any type of scrutiny. Um, along those lines, I'm first going to talk about why we see in these bills their highly partisan nature. Second, I'm going to uh, talk about some evidence that state employees are not, and public employees are in fact not overpaid, and they, their collective bargaining laws are not related to state budget deficits. I'm going to respond a little bit to some of the theoretical objections uh, that Professor McGinnis and his predecessors, uh, Wellington and Winter, have had with public sector workers. And finally, I'm going to, if I have enough time, uh, mention some of the good things that public sector unions do. And if I don't get to all that in 15 minutes, I'm sure there will be questions. Okay, so um, if you just looked at some of these laws and you thought, what are they really trying to do? Um, you, it would be hard not to notice on close inspection the highly partisan nature of them. You know, most obviously in Wisconsin, you have the exemption you have essentially eliminating collective bargaining for almost all public employees, except the more conservative and Republican-leaning police and fire employees, um, some, several of which had actually endorsed Governor Walker. Um, what you also see in the partisan nature of these uh, bills is that both the Wisconsin bill, the Ohio bill, and several other laws make these uh, jurisdictions for the public sector what are called right-to-work jurisdictions, meaning you can't require people as a condition of employment to pay their fair share of dues that go towards representing them. This is totally about crippling unions financially. It obviously has nothing to do with state budgets because it has nothing to do with paying any money to public employees. It's all about money that members of public sector unions pay to their employees. Indeed, in Wisconsin, it is illegal for public sector unions and employers to agree to dues checkoff. So even if an employee wants to voluntarily pay dues, it's illegal for an employer who would be perfectly happy to do that through checkoff to do it through checkoff. Now, interestingly enough, while the Wisconsin law and the law that was attempted to be passed in Ohio, but luckily was voted down convincingly by the voters, interestingly, while these two laws were changing practically every rule one could imagine in labor law, some you may have heard of, some you probably haven't heard of. One of the rules that they didn't change uh, was the obligation of unions to represent all of the members of a union bargaining unit whether or not they are paying union dues. But it's now illegal uh, in Wisconsin, and it would have been illegal in Ohio, to require people to pay for that. This is what conservatives would recognize in any other context as a classic free rider problem. Uh, the Wisconsin law also requires an almost comically Baroque recertification system in which unions must run for re-election uh, every year and they will only win if they get a majority not of everyone who votes in the certification election but a majority of everyone in the bargaining unit. Indeed, you have to get 51 percent of everybody in the bargaining unit independently of uh, whether they voted or not. Again, this is simply about crippling unions. It has nothing to do with state budgets. Um, and of course, there were others of these laws, and they did many more things, but I think that's just the tip of the iceberg that shows it's not really about um, budgets. Um, second, along the lines of why it's not really about budgets, um, public employees are not overpaid. Uh, relative to comparable private sector workers. To the extent there are problems that exist in public employee compensation, they exist in pension plan formulas. And if you get nothing else out of my speech today, and I do not flatter myself that I'm going to convince you of everything I say, but if you get nothing else out of my speech today, know this. In the overwhelming majority of states, with the exception of two or three, pension benefit formulas are not a legal subject of bargaining. Unions cannot, if you bargain about whether they have a defined benefit plan or a defined contribution plan or how those formulas for those plans are worked. They couldn't bargain about them in Wisconsin before the change. They couldn't bargain about them in Ohio. There are some serious problems in employee compensation in pension plans. A number of states 
uh, in the last year have changed their pension plan formulas, and I think that in many cases those were good things. But it has nothing to do with collective bargaining because those rules could never be bargained. This is sometimes confused because, of course, private sector unions can bargain about pension benefits, but in the overwhelming majority of jurisdictions, public sector unions cannot. Okay, back to pay. Um, as Sam pointed out in his uh, recent article in, in Fordham, uh, the overwhelming bulk of studies that have been done on public sector pay show that when you adjust for education and type of work and type of worker, that public employees are on the whole somewhat underpaid, even counting compensation, even counting pension compensation. Um, there are one or two outlier uh, studies such as the Heritage Foundation study, I can get into that more in the um, Q&A, but bottom line, the, uh, the Heritage Foundation study, um, in order to get to the conclusion that public sector employees are overpaid, half, has to include job security as a significant income factor and also has to make assumptions about how pension plans are funded and actuarial assumptions um, that are different than the way pension plans traditionally do it. Now that's all fine, but again, none of that has anything to do with collective bargaining. As, um, as uh, Professor McGinnis has noted in some of what his writing, public sector employees have just cause protection and have relative job security in the, even in the absence of collective bargaining, although one might wonder how secure public employment really is these days. In the past three years, they've lost 550,000 jobs in local government employment. But the point is, their public employees are not overpaid. Secondly, uh, collective bargaining rights are not correlated with budget deficits because um, collective bargaining is a state right and because there's a small handful of states in the U.S. that uh, have not provided collective bargaining rights for um, public sector employees. It's been a easy way to do some studies on this. Um, Congressman Mike Quigley in one of his statements uh, observed that, public sec that states that allow public sector collective bargaining on average have a 14% budget deficit. States that bar collective bargaining have on average a 16.5 budget deficit. For example, Texas, which prohibits all public sector collective bargaining, has one of the worst budget deficits in the nation. Nevada, which does not permit state employees to bargain collectively, also has one of the largest state budget deficits in the country. North Carolina is uh, was running a projected budget deficit, another state that doesn't uh, provide collective bargaining, running a projected budget deficit of 20 percent for 2012. On the other hand, Wisconsin, before it amended its law, was projected to have a budget deficit of 12.5 percent. Ohio was projected to have a budget deficit of 11 percent. Um, there's a really good study coming out of uh, UC Berkeley about what correlates and what does not correlate with state budget deficits and what it finds. Um, is that the main uh, factor contributing to state budget deficits is not surprisingly the housing crisis and that public sector collective bargaining rights are not really part of that. Um, collective bar um, here's some, a couple of good things in a couple of minutes I have left that unions do. Collective bargaining laws, public sector collective bargaining laws prevent strikes. Oh, I got five minutes. I can tell you several good things that unions do. Uh, effective collective bargaining laws prevent strikes. Uh, in my state of Ohio, the collective bargaining law took place in 1984. Um, after the law became effective, in the eight years from April 1984 to April 1992, there were 110 public sector strikes in Ohio, seven of which were illegal, 110 in that eight or nine year period. In contrast, in the years before the law was passed, from 1974 to 1979, a shorter time period, there were a total of 282 strikes, all of which were illegal. So you have this somewhat counterintuitive effect that passing a collective bargaining law which makes strikes legal actually decreases the number of strikes. And this effect has been seen in other states. Well, we can get into this more in the Q&A about why that is, but essentially having an effective way to channel union and employee differences with management that has mediation, fact-finding at the end of it, uh, reduces labor strife. So that's a good thing. Um, collective bargaining also can help public services be more efficient. There is a wide range of literature on, public, on unions in general and efficiency in general. I, some find some positive effects, some find some negative effects. I think it's fair to characterize literature as a whole as saying 
unions at the margins can increase productivity, although in some cases they lower it a bit. Um, we um, find that unionization of teachers correlates positively with higher student test scores on standardized tests. Um, we find, uh, again, I know that uh, teachers' unions are the, the bet noir here, but I think it's worth pointing out uh, Diane Ravitch, a name that should be familiar to some of you, uh, a former union critic, former ally of the George W. Bush administration, thank you, um, has written recently, and I'm quoting directly, schools in non-union states fare poorly or only have middling records on federal tests, while, quote, heavily unionized states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, are at the top. Charter schools are typically non-union, yet their performance on average is no better than that of regular public schools. Um, and then the, I could give you more examples of why that is in the, the, the Q&A, but I wanted to get lastly into something that uh, Professor McGinnis has written. He's written, public employees have wielded huge influence to gain perquisites for themselves at the expense of the public, early retirement, job tenure, high wages, generous defined pension plans, have, gained increasing attention from commentators and voters. Public sector unions have greatly distorted spending priorities. For example, prison guard unions have directly influenced penal policy, fighting reduced sentences, or decriminalization of drugs. Um, I have a few problems with this. Um, one of the things he writes, he continues, uh, public sector unions are likely to impose larger wage benefits than private sector unions. This is simply false. A uh, recent article that is about to come out um, in the University of Toledo Law Review by Matthew Dimmick, the wage premium in the public sector for unionized workers is smaller than the wage premium for private sector workers. Um, and the point about distorting the political process, which I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about in um, less than one minute, I want to say the following. Um, you hear a lot of the, the, the sort of resuscitated Wellington and Winter theory, two bites of the apples, what's unfair about public sector unions is they get to bargain about stuff and then they get to lobby about stuff. Because of course if you just said, you know, unions shouldn't be able to lobby, that would seem a tad unfair because there's lots of organizations that are anti-union, pro-privatization, et cetera, that get to lobby. Um, this idea about, um, you know, that I've heard, well, the unions are in favor of three strikes laws, unions are in favor of, uh, uh, of privatizing of private prisons, unions are in, opposed to uh, vouchers. Unions don't get two bites of the apple on stuff like that. Unions get one bite of the apple, and no state can unions negotiate about anything like that. Unions lobby for the things unions want to lobby about, they bargain for their interests as workers. But for those types of big public policy issues, they're not getting two bites of the apple. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, Professor Slater was the uh, conservative uh, on this panel, I guess I'm the person who's associated with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and LaGuardia because it was a axiom of progressive politics that while uh, uh, private sector unions were useful uh, for, uh, to help the progress of uh, of society and help uh, social reform, public sector unions were not. And so I want to begin by trying to understand uh, why uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was right. Uh, it's rare for me to begin a talk like that, but in this case, I think he had an absolutely important insight that there's a large difference between private sector unions and public sector unions. And I think it's important to look at these differences structurally before we look at the question of what the effects are. I don't think the worst effects of public sector unions are on higher compensation, although I do think there is higher compensation uh, than the market uh, would give in the public sector. But is there distortion of public goods, public goods that are most important for the least fortunate in society. And so that's why I think in this respect, uh, Franklin Dono Roosevelt and I are on the same side. What's the difference between a private sector union and a public sector union structurally? Well, I think there are two important differences. 
Uh, one uh, difference is the uh, nature of the uh, uh, competition. Uh, public, uh, private sector unions uh, reside in a competitive market. It makes their, that makes there substantial constraints on what the private sector unions can uh, gain uh, in uh, uh, bargaining with uh, their companies. I think an even more important difference is who they're bargaining against and the nature of the political process. Uh, in the private sector, of course, uh, private sector unions are bargaining against uh, uh, private um, uh, actors uh, who are elected by the shareholders and are not in any way connected to the private sector unions. Uh, on the other hand, in the public sector, the public sector unions uh, are uh, bargaining against politicians. They're connected to politicians, and politicians are supposed to, on the other side, though, or the other party in interest, are taxpayers. And taxpayers uh, are uh, represented by politicians. On the other hand, the unions themselves have tremendous uh, leverage over politicians, not only in the collective bargaining process, uh, but through, uh, their, uh, but through uh, their additional rights they get from public sector union laws, rights of checkoff that give them uh, substantial political power, not only to win uh, matters at the bargaining table, but then I think it's absolutely correct to win additional uh, 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 benefits uh, through legislation. And so that's the essential difference uh, that uh, the taxpayers, who are the real party in interest, are not well represented uh, by the politicians. Uh, this uh, reflects, I think, a fundamental uh, view, view of, uh, of politics, that diffuse groups tend to lose out uh, to concentrated groups. And the problem with the various rights, including collective bargaining, including checkoff, that unions get is that these mechanisms exacerbate what is already a problem in politics. There's no doubt there's already a problem with concentrated groups, but the, union, the various union laws create additional power uh, uh, to, in these concentrated groups to win out at the expense of the diffuse taxpayers. And there are two costs to that. One, which I think is actually the less of important cost, is the additional extra compensation that unions receive. I don't think I agree with uh, Professor Slater. I think this is a hard economic, econometric uh, matter uh, that compensation uh, is uh, less uh, or is, is equivalent in the public uh, sector, even when we don't look at uh, pensions. Because I do think there's the very important element of job uh, security. Of course, the question is relative job security, uh, to that in the private sector, and that is a very substantial benefit, so you would expect to see wages to be lower in the public sector. Of course, everyone in this room sort of understands that, at least everyone who's tenured, uh, we make substantially less uh, uh, than uh, people of comparable uh, education uh, and ability at, in our law school classes. And therefore, uh, w and we, w one of the reasons for that is we have very much more substantial uh, job uh, security. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, and then uh, I think there have been interesting studies that suggest that when, particularly when we just don't look at educational uh, 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 effects of public employees, but look at things like their SATs, and, which are a good proxy for IQ, that it does seem that public sector unions are somewhat overpaid, even when we look with respect uh, to their wages. When we get the pensions, and this is where you would think that public sector unions would get their exactions, uh, we see very substantial, uh, uh, I think, uh, increases. And that's exactly what you would expect uh, public choice would predict. You'd see the exactions being taken in a less transparent, more opaque way, in a way in which uh, the politicians responsible for giving them are going to be, um, uh, are going to be uh, uh, gone uh, by the time the voters realize it. I think that is also related to the nature of public sector unions, that the laws that create public sector unions make them more effective, give them more money in the political uh, process. And so I do think that, they are, that the 
the pensions that are sometimes collected in the political process are not unrelated uh, to the power uh, that uh, various laws give to public uh, sector unions. So that is a concern uh, one has. Uh, I think the greater concern uh, is, is the way, and I think this is really more the concern that reflects that of progressive era, is that public sector unions can degrade uh, public goods uh, by uh, making it harder for government to improve their delivery. And there is where I think uh, uh, we face the, uh, is the most difficult issue uh, for public, uh, that public sector unions pose uh, to a democratic society. Uh, because public sector, public goods are helpful to the least advantaged in society. And I do think that teachers unions are a case in point. Uh, a correlation is not a, a causation, of course. Uh, you might say that uh, s uh, teachers unions uh, are in states that are, tend to be richer, uh, and therefore their scores are higher. Uh, I don't think that shows that teachers unions help uh, 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 education at all. What they have done is make it very difficult uh, to make experiments in education. Uh, unions generally are not in, uh, excited about experiments uh, in education, be they Barrett pay or charter schools, because that shakes up uh, uh, the world and makes a, a less easy life uh, for their members. And particularly in a world th that we face of technological acceleration, experimentation uh, with various uh, new forms of delivery of public goods are absolutely essential. And the whole uh, aspect of collective bargaining in this respect creates all sorts of rigidities uh, in the public sector. It makes it much more difficult to experiment and to create uh, centers of competition uh, uh, through which we can uh, uh, produce public goods in a better way. Again, one could go a great deal into the teachers, uh, into the public education sector, uh, about the various uh, ways in which, uh, for instance, in New York City, it's almost impossible to fire incompetent uh, teachers because of, uh, of various collective bargaining provisions. But more b b far beyond that, uh, collective bargaining provisions with their extremely complicated uh, and uh, routinized uh, uh, procedures make it very difficult for managers to manage uh, their schools to meet public objectives. Uh, now the question is, well, maybe you just need to have better managers here. I'm skeptical of that uh, alternative because of the structural uh, features uh, that I've noted here. It's a structural problem. The managers are ultimately responsible to politicians, and the politicians are going to be unduly influenced uh, by uh, the public sector unions, not only uh, in the, uh, uh, because of the, the collective bargaining rights, but because of the power uh, that they gain uh, at election time. Uh, so those, I think, are the uh, real uh, difficulties of public sector unions, that they more go uh, to the question of their degrading of public good, that that is even worse uh, than the uh, problem of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, uh, of compensation. So, wha so what is uh, 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 my alternative? The alternative here is not is that uh, we get rid of any additional uh, special privileges of, of public sector employees uh, beyond, uh, beyond their rights as citizens to, of course, uh, petition the government uh, to participate in politics just as ordinary citizens to uh, uh, belong to associations without any uh, legal privileges. To be sure, that does not mean uh, that uh, public employees will still not have some greater influence on the government than most uh, people. Uh, after all, one of the reasons that uh, public employee unions are so powerful is that the government can only produce uh, public uh, goods through employees. And so employees already have a substantial influence more than the ordinary citizen because they uh, are the people from whom, through whom government has to work. Uh, they know more about government uh, than the ordinary citizens. What I object to is a structure of laws that give them additional power.
uh, through collective bargaining, which includes the power uh, to have additional uh, uh, leverage uh, at election time. That's the concern uh, with respect to public sector unions. Uh, one other concern I think you would have is that actually you might think that public sector unions in the long run at least, and I think this will, goes back to uh, some of the concerns of the progressive era, would tend to make uh, uh, people less enthusiastic about supporting government. If taxpayers believe uh, that a large cut of what they're going to give to, public sec to the public sector is going to go to public sector unions rather than to produce public goods, well, there's going to be less enthusiasm for a robust uh, government. Uh, so I, I think, it, while I absolutely agree that some of the attacks on public sector unions have been partisan, I don't think that detracts at all uh, from uh, the real structural concerns, the concerns about good government that I think can animate any, uh, any uh, reflection on, 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 on this topic. The fact that there are partisan attacks on public sector unions hardly suggests that there may not be also good reasons to attack, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, attack public sector unions. Indeed, of course, many of the defenses of public sector unions are an attempt to defend uh, uh, certain mainstays of the Democratic Party. I think that's really neither here nor there about the, the question of public sector unions on the merits. And as the, as the position of Roosevelt and LaGuardia suggest, I think it may well be short-sighted uh, for progressives uh, to put so much faith in public sector unions uh, because ultimately, the, if, as I believe, they tend to degrade the production of public goods, that uh, tends to uh, uh, reduce the support for these public goods. After all, if we look at the public sector, uh, and for instance, in education, it's not the wealthy who largely can go to private schools who have the most at stake in making uh, education as good as it can be. Uh, and if uh, one believes, uh, as uh, I think there's substantial evidence to suggest, that unions uh, make it harder to experiment uh, with that most important way of, uh, of increasing social mobility, uh, education, uh, I think that in itself is a reason uh, that one should have, be very concerned and think about uh, ways of uh, uh, constraining public sector unions precisely so we can experiment uh, with things that are most important uh, for the poorest uh, in society. Thank you very much. Good morning, folks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I was so pleased uh, when I was invited, and then I realized it was a 9 a.m. program, so I, <laughs> but uh, you guys are hearty souls. I have an essential, essentially Burkean case for uh, avoiding uh, radical reform in this area, but I want to first make a point. Uh, John has a, I've heard John before on this topic. I'm a great admirer of John's, and he and I agree 150 percent <laughs> on national security conservatism, let me assure you. Uh, and uh, in, in the international law area, but we, we'll disagree, disagree a little bit here. Um, first of all, uh, just on, on the point, I usually don't start with the negative point uh, about someone else's point, but unions and the public delivery of services, I, I just don't think, if we're fair to the facts, that unions are preventing innovation. Unions are preventing effective governance uh, in the state and local government. It's just not, it just doesn't, not borne out. We may not like the results of politics, it, it may not be all, all to our liking, but I just don't think it's the case. So, so let's take schools. I'm, I'm interested in school reform. I've worked with Clint Bollock on the voucher issues. I don't think the and unions may not like the, uh, charters and vouchers, n no question about it, but there are larger forces explaining the resistance, and it's not entirely the case that vouchers and charter schools are unmitigated goods. I just don't think the unions are the principal roadblock there. Schools, by and large, uh, need to do a better job of managing themselves. And, and my perception is, first thing they've got to do is maintain discipline in that, in that building. And they're not doing that. And why aren't they doing that? Let me assure you, it's not because the teachers don't want discipline. Other reasons. Some of them are legal. Uh, some of them are just a terrible management. And it can be solved. So we need to figure out what exactly is the problem. 
Foundations today are the major corrupting force, in my view, uh, in municipal governance because they bring in a ton of money to these city and local governments and they have crazy ideas. It makes no sense to take a Northwestern graduate who's had a decent judicial clerkship or an NYU graduate and say, look, we're going to give you a ton of money, $180,000 in a very small uh, group of uh, students to teach, burnish your resume, and then go apply to Yale Law School. This is essentially what we're doing. A ton of money, and, and, and people are enamored of it because money is being brought in. But that's no way to run a stable system, in my view. And teachers have a right to be concerned when it's a time that they're going to be laid off, and that they should be laid off, even though they've been at this school for 20, 30 years, and never gotten a bad a performance review, they should be laid off because the Ford Foundation has flown in some of the, uh, helicoptered in some of these uh, whiz kids. That's not an enduring reform for the school system. These people don't stay. They're not given, being given the conditions that they have to deal with. Now, John quotes progressives. You know, I hate that term progressives because it suggests if you disagree with people, you're on the wrong side of history. Um, but, you know, his use of progressives is a little bit like some people's use of legislative history. Uh, Harold Leventhal, for whom my clerk said, legislative history is like going into a crowded room at a party and picking out your friends. He's picking out his conservatives at a certain particular time. Plenty of pro progressive supported public sector uh, collective bargaining. Initially, they saw it as a restraint on their, their political discretion. So it's a question of when. Why not Truman? Is he not a progressive? Why not Bob Wagner? Why not Wagner's son? Uh, Anyway, so that, that's essentially a, a negative case. In other words, I, there are two or three things that John said that I'm taking issue with. So what's my Burkean case? First of all, I'm a firm believer in keeping courts out of most things. Now, I know that the, uh, maybe some folks uh, in this organization like courts, but this is a little bit of a very dangerous bet. The courts are going to do your politics rather than the other guy's politics. That's number one. And uh, we've, we've developed an ability in the Law Academy to dress up all of our policy preferences in constitutional, political, and uh, science language. There's just no limit to that capability. And it's really ultimately destructive to the system to have many of the contested issues of politics be the subject of uh, judicial action. And this, in fact, is the true and deep strain of progressive uh, criticism of what happened in the 20s and 30s. I know my colleague Richard Epstein disagrees with me here, but I think at the end of the day, you may make a little reform on takings jurisprudence, but you are bringing on a, a great more in the way of disaster. Federalism. This is an area for state and local governments to do their thing. They have to pay the bill. And there's a ton of variation. I mean, ordinarily, Brandeis's dictum is overstated about the states being laboratories. Here, they actually are laboratories. And it's kind of desirable that they, they can... Uh, make laws and then change them rather easily. So let me give you an example. Meet and confer statutes. In many states there are meet and confer statutes that have, uh, even, though, even though these are right to work states where there isn't collective bargaining law, where a lot of consultation ha has gone on with employee organizations. I mean, I'd hate to see an active constitutional jurisprudence in this area that takes away from state and local governments their ability to uh, govern and the people's ability to govern themselves. Wellington Winter, uh, Harry Wellington just recently died. Ralph Winter is still on the Second Circuit. They, I mean, they wrote an article in 19, uh, uh, I wish I could do this, take a truism and build it up into a book and then people attach my name to that truism. People have always known, people have always known that there's politics in state and local government. I mean, it's a little bit like the shocking response in, in Casablanca. Uh, and that's basically what the piece is about. There's always gonna be politics. Uh, I think also their thesis is overstated. To some extent, John relies on it. I don't want to bash John too much because I'm an, uh, uh, an un, uh, unmitigated uh, admirer of his. But it's just not the case that uh, in every situation, the unions are these powerful forces. Uh, in most school board elections, uh, the people, I can assure you it's true in my town, we care about nothing else than the taxes we pay for that stupid school. Now, most of us feel this way when our kids are, too, are old enough now no longer to be in that school system. But I am paying a chunk of my money. It's higher than the median income in the United States for the taxes for that system. People care about it. We look at it. That's the one thing we, we get involved with in local government. So this, it, does not, it doesn't do a good job of explaining, in my view, uh, school board uh, collective uh, bargaining. 
we are now seeing a renaissance. I think there should be a lot of discussion in this area because look at Cuomo and Emanuel. Democrats are getting into the act of public sector reform, and this isn't the first time that's happened. So there's a kind of a movement back and forth to the law. Third point, there are limits to what law can do here. Uh, Joseph made reference to Joseph is a very highly regarded scholar in labor law and public sector labor law. In many states, pensions are not a bargainable subject. I mean, so like the biggest cost item, the biggest driver of our concerns is not in fact a subject of collective bargaining. Uh, so why is it going up? Well, everyone, everyone benefits in the system. I have a friend of mine who's now gone back to teach at a University of California uh, school because she had once been at a University of California school. She's not collectively bargained, but she's in this fantastically rich University of California pension system. A lot of people, there are a lot of people in the trough, but I'm not sure it's collective bargaining that is, is generating the problem. Um, then what do we do with residual rights? John has uh, tailored a very interesting proposal about political act. Can we really ban political activity by uh, employee organizations? I think they're problematic. People who care about liberty and the First Amendment should be, should be concerned about that. You can, certainly, you can certainly by statute ban collective bargaining rights. Will it be a sustainable reform? I don't think it will. There will be necessary oscillation as we're now seeing in Wisconsin. There may be a moment in time when the anti-union forces are in, uh, are in the ascendancy, they get it, but it, it does not stick. What about civil service laws? Civil service laws are the main driver, the main driver behind the inability to fire bad teachers. That's what I'm told. I happen to think principals could do it, even with civil service laws, but they don't. That's the claim, civil service laws. Are you going to get rid of civil service laws? As I've told John on another occasion, if we're going to get rid of public sector collective bargaining laws and we're going to get rid of civil service laws, could he talk to God about getting me some height? Because, you know, I'd like that too. I have seven minutes. Um, the practical strike threat. I did my master's thesis on the Transport Workers Union. I've been primarily in private sector labor law, but I, I did my master's thesis on the Transport Workers Union, which is the first major public sector union in the country. Uh, it's mainly in New York City, uh, subway and subway workers. Uh, now, how do they ultimately get collective bargaining rights? Not because the city gave it to them. They, this is what happened. They had a practical strike threat. Now, what does that mean? They, if they walk off the, uh, off the job, the city shuts down. I got my first thorough inventory of buildings in Harlem because I had to hitchhike from the Bronx to my high school in Brooklyn, and I had trouble getting rides once I got into Harlem. I thank, by the way, the Transport Workers Union for that. When they went on strike, the city would cave. When they threatened to go on strike, the city would cave. And what does that mean? Ultimately, so you put them in jail. Okay, now you don't have a subway system. Now you're not going to put them in jail. You find them. These fines can never stick. So in a way, and I think Professor Slayer is right here, that the law that developed in New York was an attempt to deal with employee groups like the transport workers who had this practical ability to strike. It's also true of police and fire. I mean, these are the three most powerful groups in, in big cities, and sanitation. Um, now, if you have the political will to take a strike and bring in strike breakers, this hasn't, hasn't happened in the entire history of uh, public sector collective bargaining. So I'm, here goes, here's also the Burkean. Small bore institutional change. That's something we should work on. I know it's boring. I know it's not going to get me an invitation back to a Federal Society law professor meeting, but it's really where the game is. And by the way, I think there, we could get some enduring change. First of all, transparency. I would like to know more about who's benefiting from the public pension systems. I think this is doable. And why are they engaged in all the shareholder activism? How much money are they spending on it? Is it really improving their returns? Are all of the features of that, of that system uh, of, uh, that's vested in the sense not changeable by law. There are some a small changes you can make that even the public sector unions would agree they don't need uh, that would have a major impact. For example, you shouldn't be able to build up overtime in your last two or three years of service and have that be the basis for determining what your, your, uh, your pension allocation will be. It's a crazy system, in my view. Build it on some 10-year average or something. That's a simple fix. It'll save a lot of money. I know it's not exciting, but it's important. Shifting from, and this is happening already, 
shifting from defined benefit to, uh, to defined contribution. This is happening already. The unions understand they, ha they have to go along with this. And you, you increasingly remove from the pension cost uh, the, uh, the defined benefit aspect of it. Two-tier wages for new hires. Everyone loves to negotiate for the other guy. There's the major moral impulse behind socialism. And it works also in collective bargaining. You introduce the new regime for the new employees. And then over time, uh, that becomes the dominant regime. Clarify Beck rights. You know, John has a point. Joseph has a point. But the problem is in the way in which these membership clauses and collective bargaining laws are framed. It should be clear to people that if they join a union, they're not buying into politics. It has nothing to do with advancing the collective bargaining goals. And we should have a very clear mandatory clause in all these laws. This is something I'm willing to work with John and Joseph on, if they're willing to work on it, so that people have to opt into a political role by the union. I think that would be good for unions as well. Uh, some small-scale legal reform. We could use a, like a state and local government center for labor law reform. Small bore. I've got three minutes all I need. Small bore reform. For example, supervisory inclusion. I hope Joseph agrees with me here. I think it's crazy that the principals of the school are in a union. I'm not against unions, but they're supposed to be running that building. And they should be an instrument of the mayor, in my view. And I think by this, a lot of this has been introduced by very bad administrative rulings at state agencies. It could be dealt with. If there's issues on bargainability on some subjects, again, administratively, the new governor can put in these people. Status quo rights. We have a crazy system in New York where if you are uh, in a collective bargaining with, a, with an employee group and they have a very favorable contract, they have no desire to negotiate a new contract and you are stuck with that new contract until you negotiate a new one. Um, and that could be changed by administrative change. Just have this, this Federalist Society, state and local collective bargaining center go around the country and change these things would have a major impact. A Kennedy School for Public Sector Managers. You know, getting people trained who take this seriously. Uh, and one last point, DFR. The unions are scared of being sued. They have limited money. I think this is also an overstatement, but I think we can help them out a little bit here. Uh, they should not be sued uh, just because they don't take a case to arbitration. And that would make things a little easier in terms of getting out bad apples. It's in the union's interest that bad apples uh, be terminated as well. They shouldn't be sued. Let me just tell you a little story about my first arbitration. I was a union lawyer initially. And this is a case in, I mean, almost done, in the, in the bakery industry. And I was very excited because, you know, I went to NYU. I went to Columbia Law School. I had a clerkship with Powell, Lewis Powell and Harold Leventhal. This is my first case. I really wanted to win it. And every time I'm interviewing this guy, three very handsome but very tall and big and burly guys are with me at each one of these interview sessions. So in the third session, I said, Joe, why are you here all the time? I can handle this on my own. Oh, we just wanted to make sure that the grievant didn't murder you. So, so here's a case that was going to arbitration because they were afraid of a lawsuit. They actually wanted to lose. That's why I had it. Thank you. And I lost it. Okay, so now the, uh, the panelists will uh, take a couple minutes to uh, respond to, or, uh, to, uh, to their uh, fellow panelists. Well, I'll just do this very briefly since I think people who show up to a 9 a.m. conference that, uh, meeting that want to talk should be allowed to talk. So just a couple of things. Um, LaGuardia and FDR. So I wrote a book about the history of the development of public sector labor law, and I could tell you a lot about um, what LaGuardia and FDR were really thinking. The, uh, the short, snarky answer might be something along the lines of, uh, hey, do you know who signed the collective bargaining law that gave state employees the right to collectively bargain in California? Do you know, do you know? Ronald Reagan. So we can all play the, you know, hey, your icon acted counterintuitively in this issues. Um, FDR said, among other things, if we really care about what FDR, who barely had any experience with uh, private sector labor law, thought about public sector collective bargaining, his full quote that he wrote to a letter, uh, in a letter to a uh, federal sector union was, collective bargaining as it is normally understood cannot be translated into the uh, public sector, and he was correct. We have different rules for resolving impasses. We have different rules about a whole number of things, what unions can bargain about. So I don't think that's such a, a big deal. Um, I'm always intrigued when I hear people argue against the rights of public 
sector unions who say things like, well, they're really different than private sector unions. Uh, public sector unions are bad, and I always want to say, so you like private sector unions, you support them, you were behind EFCA, I assume, you like Craig Becker on the NLRB, it's just the public sector unions are the issue. I, I think that that's usually not true. Uh, and again, the whole rest of the industrialized world treats public sector unions largely the same as they do private sector unions. Um, as to the least fortunate in society, um, I agree that public services do go to the least fortunate in society. I find it rather remarkable that we think we are, that anybody thinks that we are going to provide services more effectively by slashing the wages, benefits, and workplace rights of people like teachers. Um, and again, an argument that conservatives probably wouldn't buy if we were talking about managers. Um, two quick points, even though my time is up. Finland, best school system in the world, 96% unionization rate. A couple of Sam's ideas were interesting. <laughs> uh, I wanted to respond to some of Sam's uh, uh, arguments, so, but some of them I think are just under misimpression. Nothing I suggested suggests we should have judi judges getting involved in this. It should be uh, 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 done through a democratic process of getting rid of... Uh, nothing suggests that the federal government should have anything to do with this. Uh, it should be done state by state. Uh, and I'm very much in favor of experimenting and I, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, along these lines. Well, I must say I, I disagree, and I don't think I, I've uh, heard a very substantial uh, response to why the structure is not going to lead to less innovation in public goods. Even in the private sector, uh, unions, there's a large literature suggesting that unions are not helpful to innovation. And in the public sector, for the reasons I've suggested, you would expect there to be even less, uh, because there's less pressure in the public, private sector, there's a lot of competition and that forces innovation. There's companies that don't innovate, they die. The governments are still around, of course, uh, uh, whether they innovate or not. Uh, and I think we see enormous evidence that uh, uh, teachers unions have been opposing all sorts of reforms. It's absolutely true uh, that it's so apparent now to the public uh, that uh, even the uh, people in the Democratic Party are trying to resist them in the race to the things like the race to the top. Uh, uh, but that has been a substantial problem. It, and it, it, they have been opposed to uh, charter schools precisely because it may be the case that no individual charter school, uh, or taken collectively, they're not doing better on average. But charter schools introduce a kind of dynamism into the marketplace. Uh, that over that allows innovation precisely because the good uh, uh, charter schools can be more easily copied. That's the way markets work. And not surprisingly, uh, public sector unions are not very enthusiastic about these. So I just think it's the it, it is the case uh, that if you again look at the structural features of public sector unions, uh, that it is not that you would believe uh, that innovation is going to be hurt. And moreover. Uh, there seems to be enormous evidence out there in the world that public sector unions are opposed to innovation. There may, may be other factors, but this is an important one. If I could just say one minute's worth. Um, you have two. So. Two, okay. First of all, I, I'm not always for innovation. As a good Burkean, I, I want to look carefully at the innovation uh, and what are the costs of uh, making the move. Uh, but, but secondly, uh, the government is a sluggish body. That's why we're all minimal government folks. Government doesn't change and doesn't manage well. We've got to figure out ways of doing it. I just don't think the unions are big players there. Now, could they be m more facilitative of a change? They could. I, I actually spoke at the NEA annual lawyers convention in 95 urging them to do this. But they don't. And so don't count them as being agents of important, useful reform here. But I just don't think they're important drivers either way here. Uh, and so we ought to look, I believe, in competition in schools. And we ought to look at that, uh, and uh, wh whether unions support it or not. So that's a different topic. It's just, it doesn't really connect up with unions, in my view, except that they're a political force. Uh, and unfortunately, this is the problem with politics. We empower people. They don't always do the right thing. Uh, and we're just stuck with rule by the people. <laughs>
Okay. Um, I'm going to make a couple of comments before I uh, open open uh, open up for questions. I'll end with a question. Um, the um, uh, as far as the argument that it was um, uh, that uh, Governor Walker um, uh, uh, excluded police and fire because they were uh, su some of the un unions supported him. Um, uh, Walker claimed that there were 314 police union, police and firefighter unions in Wisconsin and that four supported him. I found others uh, suggesting it was five. But in either, either event, you basically have one to two percent of the, uh, of the police and fire unions, if his number is correct, um, uh, that supported um, Walker. That calling those uh, unions conservative is a little bit like um, uh, calling a law school that has 20 percent uh, conservatives a conservative law school. Uh, only by comparison could you call such unions uh, conservative in their, in their overall, overall orientation. Um, the, the other thing was, if one of the problems with comparing states is, of course, there's a long history of uh, a, a differential background. There's also the ethnic makeup of the states. If you compare math, science, and reading scores fourth grade and eighth grade between Wisconsin, which overall ranks second in the country, and Texas, which ranks 47th, you'll find that, that these scores in Texas are higher um, at, uh, in math, science, and reading in fourth and eighth grade in 17 out of 18 comparisons. So that once you break down for ethnicity, um, a, a state that's, uh, that comes in near the last can come out um, actually uh, ahead. And I, I guess I'd like to ask uh, Professor Slater uh, one question. You said that in Wisconsin they weren't bargaining over um, over um, uh, pension, and I and I, w I wondered whether you were saying something a little uh, something more uh, narrower than I thought, uh, you, uh, because they were certainly bargaining over, or at least they were. Uh, arguing over the amount of contribution that was to be made, even if they weren't arguing over maybe some other aspect of pension. So just could you clarify what, what you meant by they weren't bargaining over pensions? Sure. What I, what I said and what I meant was that unions in Wisconsin, Ohio, and the vast majority of other states cannot bargain about pension benefit formulas. So the fact that they have a defined benefit plan as opposed to a defined contribution plan, or as Sam was saying, they count the high three years, instead, or in some cases, some public sector pension plans are counting the high one year. It was even worse than that. Or that they let people double dip into their pensions, uh, as, as some union critics have said, although that's hardly a problem uh, unique to unions. Those are the sort of things that unions can almost never bargain about. It is, of course, true that they, in some states, can bargain about employee contributions to pension funds. And, of course, what's notable there about Wisconsin is when the uh, uh, Governor Walker proposed this law, what he said, the unions said, we will give you what you want on the pensions, just don't, don't take away our collective bargaining rights. And uh, of course, Walker did not go along with that. Really quickly, uh, also in response to the uh, partisan nature in Wisconsin, um, before we get into the percent of unions, I mean, you'd want to know more than the number of locals who did or didn't endorse Walker, you would want to know um, the number of people in those locals. So it's not true just because there's one out of a hundred locals or five out of a hundred locals, that doesn't mean one to five percent of the police and firefighters. And more broadly, it was, it was clearly a divide and conquer tactic. I mean, yes, you, um, police and firefighter unions are A, more politically conservative and B, often more politically popular uh, than uh, some of the other unions, so excluding them was for partisan purposes. If you really think, as Professor McGinnis does, that unions distort public, the provision of public services in all sorts of bad ways, there's no reason to exclude police and fire. But that's not what he really thinks. Okay, questions. Now, uh, Governor Walker, that is not, I wasn't referring to Professor McGinnis. If you come forward, give your name, school, and then ask your question. Uh, my name's Paul Salamanca. I teach at the University of Kentucky. My question, I think, is most particularly for, for John McGinnis. Um, isn't the problem, let's say, baked into the cake in the sense that, uh, John, uh, whether uh, public employees organize collectively and sort of uh, make decisions by majority rule that, that are binding on the, on the dissenting members, isn't that actually irrelevant? Because it's always in the interest of people who, who essentially have a, have a rent right, like teachers or people who run the only subway in town, it's always in their interest politically uh, to, to, to obtain that kind of rent and to preserve it 
And so whether they have a formal structure of a union or not, or whether they can exact these kinds of concessions from the government or not, they have a collective concentrated interest in doing that, and they can achieve their purposes with or without those kinds of protections. They can do it through the judiciary. As we've seen, lots of state Supreme Courts have said you have a right to education and mandatory funding and so on. In other words, isn't the it's baked into the cake and there's really nothing you can do about it once we decide that a particular essential service is going to be provided almost exclusively by the government. Uh, well, I agree to some extent that there, as I, I think I was quite clear, I, I don't want to seem to be Pollyannish, there is a, always, uh, uh, given that they have a collective interest, uh, public employees are going to pursue those collective interests through politics and nothing I am suggesting says that they can't have their ordinary uh, First Amendment rights. But that doesn't mean that the mechanisms that government gives don't uh, allow them to get around certain free rider problems. Uh, uh, for instance, to not to, uh, to have a mechanism that doesn't allow people, force people to opt in uh, for contributions that go to politics, uh, that doesn't allow them uh, to have a right uh, to uh, uh, collective bargaining. These are advantages that are given by law that promote uh, their interests that uh, other organizations don't have in society that may have common interests. So I, I wholly agree, and uh, that's what I think is in some sense so uh, disturbing about public sector unions. You might think that this is already a problem of public, employee, public employees joining together, a political problem uh, just of a kind of Mankor Olson type, but the government exacerbates this problem. And when you talk, of course, about judges uh, giving um, uh, right to education and, uh, and the, the school litigation, of course, those judges are appointed by politicians. And politicians are very concerned about uh, union contributions. So I don't think that is exogenous uh, to the issue of public sector union uh, uh, rights. Can I just interject for one moment? Uh, even if you didn't have collective bargaining rights, you'd have employee associations, and they would bring out the vote for the governor, number one. Number two, I think on the area of the authorization to engage in external politics, I think there, there could be common ground. I mean, we could strive for it to change what the, the background rule is, so you do have to opt in for the political activity. Yes. Uh, my name is Mark Roth, and uh, for almost 30 years I was general counsel of the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO, the largest federal sector union. I don't know, Professor McGinnis, what you know about us and the work we do, but I did take great offense to your remarks that we degrade the delivery of public services because our people, our members, get involved almost primarily because they're frustrated with their managers, the political appointees, and the changes in government every 18, 24, four years, two years, eight years, that prevent them from providing the best services. Um, I don't know where you got your facts. I don't know if you've ever worked for the federal government, and maybe you'll let us know that. Um, but just an example, in the 1990s, there was a movement called Labor Management Partnership, where we said, okay, we can always, we know how to fight. Why don't we learn how to engage in a partnership where we can deliver things more efficiently and cost effective and quicker rather than bargain over the edges for two years on, on delivering a product. Um, we did that at the Mint very successfully. A study by a group called Dalbar found that there was better customer service at the Mint than at Nordstrom's. The social, they found the social security teleservice phone line was more responsive than corporations like Disney. And at FEMA, I'll only say they had a strong partnership under Jim Witt and responded to every emergency effectively. And when we went to Brownie, I don't think I have to say what happened then. So we literally delivered tens of thousands of action items that changed the delivery of services. These are all recorded in the National Performance Council, uh, Vice President Al Gore's reports on the National Performance Review, and I suggest you just look at the executive summaries, because I think when you go out to the public and say that all unions are preventing deliveries of services, 
that you, you don't know what you're talking about. I can't say it in a nicer way than that. Thank you, sir. Uh, I did work for the federal government, and uh, of course, uh, I think you misunderstand uh, my uh, presentation if you think my attempts is to insult uh, people who work for the federal government. I'm not insulting government workers at all. I am suggesting that the constraints uh, and the structure of public sector unions does not advance uh, the public goods that the government provides. That's very different from insulting workers. A anyone, uh, employees, I'm sure, are very good people, but they work within a structure of uh, incentives and constraints. And I think a, uh, public sector unions don't advance the kind of incentives one would like to see in the workplace. It's not at all uh, a, an insult to public uh, uh, employees. It's a, in fact, you might think that public employees, uh, or many of the public employees, uh, will... Sir, I didn't think that you were insulting public employees, public employee unions. I felt you were insulting and ignoring a major part of history, that's okay, all. Excuse me, uh, again, I'm not insulting public employee unions, even their leaders. They work under the constraints of law. That's one of the things one learns in law, that people respond to structures and incentives. The question, I'm, I'm arguing that the structures in society should be changed. I'm not suggesting that anyone is uh, acting in any way improperly or immorally given the constraints and structures they face. I think by changing these structures, we'll have a better society because I think uh, public sector unions will receive closer to their market wages, number one, and number two, we'll have better uh, 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 production of public goods because we won't have the kind of constraints on in innovation that the structures of unions uh, uh, do on government. Not uniquely, there are a lot of other problems that governments have in producing public goods, but the, the nature of that structure that I've, uh, that I've shown, that it enforces concentrated groups at the expense of the public, is my presentation. Not in any way an insult to any even union worker. Next question. My name is Bruce Cameron. I teach at Regent, and I am, in fact, a, one of the lawyers involved in the Walker litigation. I'm a counsel of, of record for the employees. My question is for Professor Slater, and you'll be pleased to know I've assigned my students to read one of your articles for the next class. You say that what's going on in Wisconsin is all a matter of politics, partisan politics, versus any budgetary concerns. My question to you is this. If you have one model for determining wages, which is closed door bargaining, in which the government has to bargain in good faith, the public's not involved, and you have another model for determining wages in which the public is directly involved through their representatives, you are saying to me that those result in exactly the same wage rates? I'm not sure, I, I think your question has a couple of different parts. Your question is, first uh, of all, am I saying that there is no union wage premium in the public sector? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there's a smaller union wage premium in the public sector than the private sector, contrary to what Professor McGinnis's theory would predict. Second, are, are you at, is your suggestion that in the absence of collective bargaining processes that there is somehow a more open democratic process where the people get to choose what employees are paid? Yes, as to your second question, and yes, I, as to your first. If, in fact, you are saying yes, that there is a premium, that, in fact, unionized employees would be paid more if they were required, if, that is, if the state were required to negotiate with them in good faith, than if the taxpayers voted on their wages then it seems to me that and, 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 that uh, refutes your point that this is simply partisan and has nothing to do with the budgetary concerns of the state. And in what model do taxpayers, I, I mean, I am a public employee, and I'm not aware that the taxpayers vote on my compensation or the compensation of anybody else at my institution. 
I, the, I, I don't understand your model. They, I guess. well, the taxpayers vote through their representatives on, the, and that's significantly different because the state does not have to respond to taxpayers or bargain in good faith with them. On the bar collective bargaining model, they do. Okay, That's, so, so, so this, this, right, this gets back to the Wellington winner theory and in part what uh, Professor McGinnis was saying and in part what, uh, what, what Mark Roth was saying. Yeah, this is sort of magical thinking that you get better uh, public services, again, if you slash wages and compensation workplace rights. Um, the data shows, again, and I did not really hear any contradiction in this from Professor McGinnis, the data shows that public sector employees are not paid above market value, even those public sector employees who have uh, collective bargaining rights. If, if you imagine that the way people get paid in the public sector is that there is some conscious decision by the public, I, I think that's also somewhat um, ma magical thinking. The original response to the Wellington and Winter theory, the Wellington Winter theory, and two bites of the apple, public sector unions were going to get too much political power, the sorts of things that you hear Professor McGinnis saying. The, the, the original and still probably best response to that was an article Clyde Summers wrote in 1980. Six, where we pointed out two things. Um, boy, people are throwing things at the audience and, and not yet at me. That's good. Um, that, um, first of all, the, the, the power of unions in this process is greatly overstated. As, as a former, uh, it shouldn't surprise you to hear, union attorney myself, I wish my clients had the powers that uh, Professor McGinnis uh, ascribes to public sector unions, but they don't because there are lots of other groups who are not as diffuse as Professor McGinnis suggests, groups in favor of privatization, low tax groups, uh, groups that lobby in favor of private prisons because they're the people that build the private prisons or they're the people that run the private schools. There's all these other groups in society um, that are counterforces to unions. And as it turns out, as Summers pointed out, if you take away collective bargaining rights from employees, then they get crushed in the political process because what people want, when you let the people rule, which Sam seems to have ambivalence about, but anyway, when you let the people rule, um, what you get is people, and I think this is something we could all agree on, what the American people want and what the people in all our localities want is more public services for less money. So that would make it a budgetary issue. And, they're gonna, and public employees will get crushed, and you will get lower paid public employees, and you will get worse public services. In any other context, conservatives would say, if you cut wages and benefits and workplace rights, you will get lower quality people doing those jobs, and that's true in the public sector as well. Next question. Hi, Scott Moss, University of Colorado Law School. Um, for John Largely, but anyone who wants to field it, um, John's argument had me convinced for a minute, and I'm more on you know, Joe's side of the fence on these things, but that I was convinced for a minute, at least partly by the argument that if you um, leave a lot of waste in uh, public spending on compensation, then people would be less sympathetic to spending on these public programs, so we have to make them lean and efficient to, um, to keep them supported. Um, you know, the, then being um, somewhat back and forth myself with these panels on topics I don't know a lot about, like unions, because I don't. Um, Joe convinced me back that maybe it isn't that much of an empirical phenomenon that unions cause waste, but more generally, John, my question is this, which is, at events like this, I feel like you've made the argument, that your argument you're making that to have these public services be supported, we have to cut the unionization and increases spending on them. The problem is that in my state, Colorado, and in others, the same folks who are fighting the teachers' union hard also have cut the school budgets a lot. I feel like there's no cluster of free market folks or conservative or federalists who actually oppose public unionization but actually want to spend a decent amount of money on these services. The same folks who are arguing against unionization actually don't want to spend the money on these services. Um, and then generally, Two, the argument that there's rent seeking their principal agent problems. You know, there's a behavioral economics panel in antitrust going on at the uh, other hotel. And there, there's at least one Federalist Society member arguing, oh, don't worry about principal agent problems and rent seeking. So it seems like some of these devices are rhetorical devices that are used instrumentally so that when there, is, there are musings about principal agent problems or rent seeking in big business, there's a good Confederate Society member at the other hotel saying, don't worry about them too much, they're overstated, they're not empirically shown, whereas when there are alleged principal agent problems are rinsing in unions, suddenly it is a big deal. It seems like there's an inconsistency depending on whose ox is being gored. Well, that's a sort of hard 
a question to answer. I don't know exactly what uh, someone's saying at another hotel at the <laughs> moment. It's a little difficult to defend uh, that proposition. All I can say is what I believe, I think the principal problem of government is this, that we actually don't spend enough on, on often public goods and we spend too much on, for instance, entitlements. And I see public sector unions as essentially a kind of entitlement. Not, this structure leads, not surprisingly, the public sector union to be focused on not the production of the service, but the welfare of their employees, which I see much more like, you know, as you're, you're worried about not something the government should be f principally focused on, a public good, but the welfare of some particular individuals, a distributional could I concern. Ask, could, I if my, my, could I just f finish? This is a kind of a distributional concern. And so that is, I think, is very consistent. I want, I want to try to explain how this is, is, is I think, consistent with an overall philosophy of government, uh, that we should spend a lot on, po my greatest worry, for instance, about the federal budget at the moment is we're not, uh, our, 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 the dis quote, discretionary spending, the spending on public goods, on, in, on science research, is being crushed by entitlement spending, which is the same kind of concern of, uh, uh, of, of things going to uh, 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 concentrated groups, the ARP, uh, as, I, as reflected in my concern about public unions. So at least I think I can say that I'm consistent. I can't say that everyone's consistent. I think that's a bit much to ask me. Sam, did you, did you have well, something you want to say? The problem I have is calling all of these things entitlements. I mean, um, um, First Amendment rights in, in these employee organizations which preceded uh, collective bargaining, they're all about their entitlement, so to speak, navigating the civil service system, concentration. I just don't know how far your theory goes. If, it's, if you're going to, uh, I don't know what's going to be gained by it, but I don't know how far you are going. Because if you're talking about the funding of external political activities, that's a separate, very small problem. But if you're talking about the ability to organize and have majority vote determine what the employee position will be on wages and benefits, that's another issue. So, what do you? What if you had your druthers? What would be outlawed? Well, any, any First Amendment rights? Of course, people have a right to create. A, you're right, an employee association. And as I've suggested, that their employees are always will have some substantial leverage in the workplace. This gives them additional leverage. I mean, certainly you cannot get rid of their First Amendment rights, and I'm not at all suggesting that. Gene. Yeah, um, I was curious, and I think it was Professor Slater's point, but I, 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 I'm, I'm not totally certain. The, 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 it's kind of intriguing argument about, well, public sector bargaining is, is, is helpful in not both, reduce, both reducing strikes uh, well, I guess mostly we're saying in terms of reducing strikes. Is this your point? That was my point. Yeah. And I was interested in the reaction to that. Uh, I thought I, um, uh, from, from, from e either of the other panels, was I thought. I think uh, it's true in this following sense. The employee groups that have the practical ability to pull off a strike are regulated by the state labor laws. Uh, whereas it has also increased the, the leverage of groups like uh, the clerical workers, uh, you know, ask me kind of locals uh, that they would not have had because they did not have enough police, fire, sanitation, transit. They all had a practical strike threat, and these laws were in tandem. They, they, they were also laws to regulate uh, strikes, prohibit them, but provide an, an, a substitute mechanism like interest arbitration in the case of uh, police and fire. So, in that sense, they've created a system. Whereas previously you would have had strikes that you couldn't effectively deal with. Uh, the, the, of course, uh, uh, the, it may well be the case that uh, uh, in certain instances you'll have fewer strikes. Now, first of all, if you don't have any employee unions at all, I think it's often very hard to organize a strike from an employee association. But of course, that may come with a very high price. Uh, you, you have no strikes because you pay a higher wages, so of course you're going to have fewer strikes. You're also going to lose uh, substantial control 
over your workplace. So there may, that may be a benefit. It could easily be outweighed by the kind of costs I'm, I'm suggesting. But as studies show, since public employees are not overpaid, that fear has not come to pass. Well, this I just completely disagree with uh, uh, Professor Slater. You, you do not correct for the tenure issue. You do not also correct for the fact that pub what the recent study that has suggested uh, that public employee unions, particularly uh, are, have, when you look at their SAT scores, they are overpaid. It is a mistake, and I think any labor economist would think it is a mistake, simply to look at the inputs of education rather than the raw cognitive ability of employees in reflecting even, even their wages, let alone their total compensation. Well, I, I, I believe you when you say that you believe it's a mistake, but I will just point out, as Sam has pointed out, that the vast majority of compensation studies, including studies in states like Ohio where the strike effect was true, show that public employees are not paid more than private but do, employees. Are they, are they, do they correct for the, the issues that I'm pointing out, which seem to be overwhelming issues, the issues you of have, tenure would, and the issues of cognitive ability? You would have to give an incredible amount of weight, as the Heritage Study does, to job security to get to the numbers you think you want to get to. And there's a, if, if you're interested in this, there's a debate between uh, Jeff Keefe at Rutgers and uh, Jason Richwind and Andy Biggs at Heritage and American Enterprise Institute. And it's I very hard to do these studies. I encourage uh, everybody to read them. Historically, public sector employees receive lower wages in, in return for job security. It's just very hard to do. But, 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 but I'm not saying you're. I'm not saying you're wrong. But on the benefits side, the benefits are richer. There's no it's question. Very hard the benefits to monetize are richer, all that. Well, it's it's these studies attempt to uh, include the benefits, and what I've heard a lot of today is, and I'm sorry, I know you're waiting to give your question, so I'll, I'll make this quick, but I've heard a lot of today is, you know, my theory would predict all these bad things would happen. And I say, but there's these studies that show that doesn't happen. And you say, yeah, but I'm not so sure about those studies. Again, we're talking about making radical changes, taking away rights that people have had in this country for 50 years and have all over the rest of the world. And if it's, you know, on this basis, I don't, you know, I have a theory that predicts it and the studies that say my theory is wrong, I have some questions about, I don't know. Go ahead. We, uh, we have uh, time, I think, for two questions as long as questions and answers are relatively brief. My name is Justin Schubel. I'm speaking in my personal capacity. Um, just one thing I would point out regarding the difference between, say, teachers' unions and firefighters and policemen's unions is the difference in the civil um, service standards and exams. And this could be due to the fact that firefighters depend on their lives, um, based on, you know, put their lives in the hands of their coworkers, and teachers do not. And also, the public really cares about whether they can get carried out of a building in a certain way, and the effects of teaching are harder to witness. If you look at countries like France, which does have a very strong centralized education system, they simply have a national exam for teachers and they just pick from the very top. In other words, it's essentially an intelligence test and it's sort of unthinkable to do anything like that in the United States. And they also, by the way, have required that PhD students also teach in public schools exactly the kind of helicoptering, which I would say is actually a great thing for the school systems. Um, I would, my question for, I guess, Professor Slater and S. Stryker would be, what do you have to say about the effects of public sector unions in municipalities such as Washington, D.C., that are effectively um, a single party state? But in, even in New York City, and I, again, the, the reason for, for this dominance ha doesn't have to do with the unions, there are lots of other things, but even in New York City, if there is a, a, a really good candidate like Giuliani or LaGuardia or Lindsay as he appeared in his first term, they can get elected even in New York City. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think unions are a driver in this. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. I lived in D.C. for 12 years, uh, mostly in the 1990s, uh, when the government was a heck of a lot more dysfunctional than it is in D.C. now, back in the good old Marion Barry days. And uh, we all made jokes about that, but I don't see that the unions were the problem in there. Next question. Last yeah. question. My name is John Axelrod. Among my uh, prior experiences was being Joe's, Joe's boss when he represented unions in the District of Columbia. It seems to me that a large part of the demonization of public sector unions ignores the fact that they're inherently democratic organizations and that the stances that the leadership takes reflects the stances of the employees they represent. And the duty of fair representation and the duty 
of only to, rep of, of, to represent non-members as well as members means that they take the positions that will get them elected rather than the positions that might be more accommodating to the benefit of the society as a whole if you distinguish between the benefits of workers and the benefits of society as a whole. If you eliminate elections, which no one is going to propose to do, you might get more accommodation. If you eliminate the inherent con conflict between management, which I think in many cases is incompetent, and unions, and, and have a, a, an era of, of accommodation, which at one point was the goal of, of the federal government at least, you will get more accommodation and less conflict. But when you say it's the union's fault, what you're really saying is it's the employee's fault because the unions are supposed to foster the interests of the employees who they represent, the employees who pay their salaries directly and indirectly. And I might add that there is more democracy in the way unions participate in the political process and there is democracy in the way corporations participate in the political process because there's no rough equivalent of Beck in corporate shareholder rights. Thank you. Oh, well, I, in some sense I quite agree with that comment. There's no doubt that unions represent the interests of their employees largely. The difficulty is that those interests are not those of the general public. I'm not saying they're always completely 180 degrees different, but they're different. The interest of the employees is in getting high salaries for not very uh, demanding jobs. The interest of the public is in the production of the public goods. So I, so I think you're actually, in some sense, making exactly the point that I am, that there is this contrary interest, and the difficulty is that with respect to these uh, unions, uh, they are given legal privileges that help them advance those interests, and given that the diffuse public has relatively little power over politicians, vis-a-vis -vis the unions, particularly with uh, uh, the uh, not, no requirement that uh, their union employees opt out uh, for politics, that's the, the power. I am not at all saying that unions don't represent some of the interests of their employees. I think that is not socially optimal for society, and that structure uh, helps, um, uh, inhibits the production of public goods that would benefit society. So I don't think in some sense we disagree. I, I think we fundamentally disagree because <laughs> you seem to think that the people who are represented by unions are not part of the society as a whole. No, they're and what I, would, what I would suggest is that they're closer to the 99% than, than the 1%. And it's the 99% that really are not having an equal role in the political process. I um, uh, wanted to just make one remark uh, since our time is almost up. Uh, one is uh, I, I looked up uh, Cincinnati voting in the last two elections, <laughs> and uh, they went 53-47 uh, for Bush in 2004 and 54-46 uh, uh, for uh, Obama in um, 2008. Um, so it uh, suggests that they are uh, pretty, pretty much evenly split, but, uh, but at least, uh, so again, by comparison to other guess. cities, um, uh, they are relatively re Republican, but uh, compared, uh, otherwise they are pretty much in line with the uh, general population. Um, the, uh, I, I wanted to say just, the one thing I wanted to say in the end is, uh, you know, this is a nice illustration of uh, how the Federal Society uh, does things in the sense that uh, unlike some of its um, imitators um, uh, on the left, um, it asks a question that um, uh, that's, uh, uh, often wouldn't be asked, a fairly basic question, and there's a genuine effort to get balanced panels. That means sometimes you're not going to have a balanced panel, sometimes you are, and sometimes you'll have it balanced against the position that you might expect Federalist uh, members more to favor, and this is one of those times, and I think we ought to give uh, applause for uh, the panel as well as the organizers. <laughs>